actually wanted to show you something, uh, Mike and Joe. Tell me what you think about this. So there's a frozen yogurt store down the street from actually that's actually quite interesting. So when 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 I lived in Nashville or the Nashville area, when we lived there, you basically it was almost impossible to find frozen yogurt. I don't know if that's just true of this, you know, some parts of the South in general, but like coming from like LA or even living in Las Vegas, there's like tons of froyo shops, but there's almost none in and around Nashville. So then I get to Florida office and there's, there's a bunch of them, which is great. And I go to this one near me and I talk to the owner there and he says, you know what, we can't survive and, and make our rent just selling frozen yogurt. So we have to sell like nutritional supplements too, because there's a gym <laughs> next door. Like I'm not a big, as you can tell, I'm not like a big <laughs> type of a person. And I haven't looked at nutritional supplements lately or like protein powders, but like a lot of it was stuff like um, here, like this, I took this picture. Like it actually reminds me, have you ever been in like a oh, fireworks store? A fireworks, I was just gonna say, it looks like a fireworks it's, store, yeah. So <laughs> would you feel safe consuming this product? No, I mean like, you <laughs> would, Jerry? No. Yeah, I mean, I like drink so many energy drinks, so much caffeine. I think that you know, this probably wouldn't be that different. <laughs> you think it's okay? I mean, it. Like, I feel like if you take this and you die, it's sort of on you. It's <laughs> fairly warned by this label. So, Well, you probably uh, do something epic before you do that. I mean, pandas are like the most gentle, kind creatures on Earth, as are unicorns, and we turn them like these evil, you know, uh, monsters. So, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll give it a try and report back to you. If I seem agitated on the next webinar, you'll know why. <laughs> When I, I haven't been in like a GMC store in forever, but I feel like, yeah, the last time I was in a store like that, everything looked very boring and just a bunch of text. Like, I wonder if this is what GMC stores look like now. This is, I mean, look, I, I feel like the whole world is moving in this direction with, with branding and it's sort of like the, the crazy, crazy vacation of, of every product or the <laughs> TikTokization of, of the world as we know it. I feel like this is sort of the way things are moving. Right, I don't know. Get people's attention, yeah. But I, I never remember seeing this type of stuff before. But it looks like this is uh, this is it now. So speaking of TikTok, uh, I think probably you, most people have seen this, but uh, looks like Gen Z is now using TikTok and Instagram to search more than even Google at this hmm. point, hmm. which is amazing. And that's why, like your earlier statement today, Mike, that you could actually learn something on TikTok was sort of a revelation to me because I didn't think that was actually possible. <laughs> so I get, I, how, I mean, what does it mean to use TikTok as your search engine? Like, does that mean we're only consuming that type of, that, that generation is only consuming that type of content? There's no like wanting to know what the, you know, capital of Iowa is anymore. I mean, I mean, there's definitely, I feel like a lot of people on, especially Facebook who ask questions that could have been answered a lot quicker if they had just Googled it. And yet they still feel the need to crowdsource it. Yeah. I mean, do you want to watch a five minute video to answer a one second question <laughs> on screen? So it's interesting. And I guess the question for, for, you, for everyone is, is this making us smarter as a species? Are you asking, you're asking, I'm asking, asking? I'm asking you, I guess you, you guys can actually talk, but I mean, in the chat, feel free to comment too. And we can have a long, you know, debate about what knowledge actually is, but I mean, are, is this making us smarter as a species? I mean, this is sort of crazy, I think. Yeah, I feel like this really worries me. There's so many people on TikTok that you have no idea who that person is, if they're an expert in it, and yet they say something, and it's usually food related. Don't eat this, or eat this, or I discovered it. And you see in the comments, all of these people saying, oh, finally somebody said it, or I've been saying that all along, as if like that's like a true expert or anything. Like, who is that person? Is somebody in their living room? It, to me, the genius of TikTok and the thing that makes it so addictive to me and that makes me just sort of doom scroll for hours is that it preloads the video for you before you get there. So mm -hmm. as soon as you swipe, it just instantly starts playing. Yeah. Like, I feel like I, if I even had to wait a half second, I'd be just done with it. Like, oh, I don't want to wait. But the fact that it's instant, <laughs> it's just a different type of experience, I think. So 
Um, there was a really good article in the Atlantic, uh, I think about a month ago, though, about how people aren't using Google as much because the Google home screen is so messy and there's so many options. And they were saying that there's a rise in people specifically searching Reddit because they feel like they can get the answer quicker through Reddit than having to, you know, go through all the options on the Google home screen. Yeah, and it's very true. Like a lot of these companies, they'll, they'll hire uh, behavioral psychologists and sort of people that can optimize for to create addiction to get to use these platforms. So even like the scrolling or, you know, when you pull down your screen to refresh it, it's meant to simulate the feeling of like pulling on a slot machine handle, right? Because you never know what you're going to get. It's always like you're playing a game and and just, you know, anticipating the next thing. And there's a little bit of luck, a little bit of chance involved. And it just keeps you engaged. But uh, it's amazing. You can sit down with something like TikTok and like four hours later, like what just happened? It's quite scary. I get that okay. little video telling me to get off TikTok. Yeah. I'm TikTok all the time. So we're still in that the first three minutes when we're, everyone's just filing in and we just sort of have interesting news stories up that may or may not have anything to do with food. But did you see this thing that they just canned the Batgirl movie? This is crazy, yeah. This is crazy. So they've completely filmed it. They've almost finished it. They spent all the money already. And not only are they not going to release this movie in theaters, they're pulling it off streamings and they're just canning it completely. Hidden from public view forever, apparently. I mean, how bad can it really be? Yeah, we've had <laughs> horribly crappy Batman movie <laughs> in the past. Like, remember the one with like, like Jim Carrey and all, was that Batman Forever or something? Yeah. yeah. Bad. <laughs> like, how bad would this thing have to be? To kill? But doesn't that make you want to watch it more now? Yeah, exactly. Well, Maybe is that's this the, actual the marketing. Brilliant issue. marketing that they took a, yeah. a movie and created all this overnight demand. <laughs> And it's I don't like know. the Taco Taco, which we're going to talk about. We're going to take away it, your it, Taco it, Taco and then everybody wants it. Yeah, That is a good segue <laughs> into the Taco Taco. But I do want to use this, and this is our one major public service announcement for, um, for this webinar. While there are some movie series that can go disastrously bad, there is one movie series that is reliably <laughs> always great. And if you have not seen it yet, I've told you about this last time. I'm telling you about it again right now you need to watch the Paddington movies. This is very, very important. So if you take only a few things away from this week, I hope this is one of them. So in chat, I would ask, if you've seen <laughs> either Paddington or Paddington 2, please let your colleagues know and share what you thought about the movie. It will uplift you. It'll melt away any cynicism you have about the world. It'll make you want to be a better person. Uh, and we could all use a little bit of that these days. So uh, there's my PSA. Mike, have you seen this yet? I haven't watched it. No. Shame on you. I so, know. Okay, uh, let's go. So <laughs> um, ne not today, but our next webinar, which is on August 18th, is going to be a special one. Uh, we've done a, a really, really um, substantial piece of industry research in collaboration with many of your companies, um, a lot of suppliers, uh, I think over 100 different companies provided input that we call one table. And this year's one table is all about um, labor, supply chain, and inflation, and what suppliers to the food service industry should be doing um, given these challenges that operators are facing right now. This is a sort of a mammoth piece of research. It is um, really, really impressive work. And we're gonna be sharing all of those details with you in two weeks on this webinar. If you can, I would invite all of your colleagues to attend. They're gonna learn a ton about how to navigate this environment. Operators are completely changing their behaviors. They have different need states right now, given supply, labor, inflation challenges. And we're gonna show you what you should be doing in light of that. So share this with all your colleagues, make sure they register. It's gonna be uh, time really, really well uh, well spent. And uh, and the, the research is um, you know brought to, from, from us to you uh, at no cost, really for the benefit of the industry. So uh, make sure you attend that one. Uh, make sure you also hit chat right now and say hi to all your colleagues from around the industry. When you do chat, make sure you choose either all panelists and attendees or everyone. I'm not sure what it says, depending on which version of Zoom that you're on. And maybe we can just get the chat started. Um, what is the best thing? I want everyone to answer this. What is the best thing you ate in the last week? And if it's not that impressive, that's okay, because we can't always have impressive food. But what is the best thing you ate in the last week? Uh, for me, I had a bowl of gyudon uh, yesterday, which is sort of like that Japanese beef and rice dish, which I love. Uh, Mike, how about you? Um, I went camping over the weekend in Michigan, and it's peach season. So I had some Red Haven peaches that were amazing. Peaches, okay. Yep, peaches. And uh, Jared? 
I got Little Caesars uh, last Friday. Crazy bread. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let's see what everyone else has. Okay, so keep answering and let's go ahead and get started. So we have some brand new content in Report Pro to check out. I think many, if not most of you and your companies subscribe to Report Pro already, which is great. Here's some new content that's sitting in there for you if you have a subscription. One, we have a report on preparing for the recession that talks about um, where we are with the economy and what this means for the world of food. There is a really great diner round where you get to sort of travel around the country, this time to the South as we look at the revival or refreshing of Southern food and what some of those um, new sub-trends within Southern looks like. And we have, um, this is something we talked about in our last webinar, but it's such an important report that we wanna make sure you get a chance to check it out if you haven't already, which is our mid-year trends report. It's 120 pages of all the important trends you need to know at sort of the, the, the halfway point of 2022 and going forward. If you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, be sure to do so. It's, it's really fantastic stuff. As a reminder, there's just a ton of stuff in Report Pro. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. It is a great resource to have. And if you only subscribe to a portion of it, uh, you know, talk to us and take a look at what else is in there because there's quite a lot. I think at this point, we're up to, I don't know, 1,400 reports that are all available at your fingertips. Okay, so Mike, you're going to take us through what's happening in the world of food. Let's go. Let's go. All right. So here's some of the weird, interesting stuff that helps us keep tabs on the industry. And I think we've covered branches every year that they have celebrated National Mustard Day. So National Mustard Day is August 6th. It's coming up this weekend. So they always do something a little wacky for National Mustard Day. I believe in 2019, they did the mustard ice cream and then they did mustard beer. Last year, they did the hot dog buns that were infused with mustard. But this year, they're doing mustard donuts. So they're working with Brooklyn's Dough Donuts that to release the mustard donuts locally in New York. And then they also distributed them nationally for a little bit. Does this have a mustard filling or is it more like mustard flavored batter? I don't know, actually. I, if you look at the picture there, it does kind of look like there's a filling coming out. But yeah, it looks like it's the, the kind of mustard sprinkle on top. I mean, couldn't you just put a hot dog inside the donut as well? Oh, yeah, it? really? Seriously? Yeah, it worked pretty well. <laughs> It'd be so popular at like a, a state fair or something like that. Absolutely. Okay. And then kind of a similar option, you know, some of these weird um, foods that a lot of these brands are releasing. So Velveeta came up with the Velveeta Veltini, which is basically exactly what it, uh, what it sounds like, which is a Velveeta Martini. So they actually take Velveeta cheese, they infuse it in vodka overnight, and then they use that vodka to make a martini. They do a Velveeta cheese rim that you can see dripping down the side. They have Velveeta um, olives there, and then they do the giant shells and cheese um, that are on the garnish there. And so they release this at BLT restaurants in major cities across the country. So if you've been to like BLT steak. They had it on the menu there. And then through Gold Belly, they also had national distribution where you could get all the ingredients. That's a fine dining restaurant, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a nice restaurant. Yeah. You, you get this, you can get this in fine dining. Yeah. 15 bucks. It seems like it would be really messy to drink. Yeah. <laughs> unless you have a straw or something. I think the, the cheese drip is the, like the main thing that that kind of weirds me out a little bit. But I would I like Velvet. I think shells and cheese is delicious. So I would try. I mean, it sort of makes sense. You think about the flavors in a traditional martini. It's really not that. Far and like, off. yeah, you have, you know, cheese, you know, blue cheese, olives or things like that. So. Velveeta is doing such a good job with their branding lately, too. I think their ads look great. And then I think a lot of people might have seen this. I actually went to Walgreens yesterday, which is exclusively distributing this to try to get it, but they didn't have it yet. So this is Brock's Tailgate Candy Corn. So the past few years, they've come up with some unusual candy corns. But this year, I think they kind of blew the past years out of the water because they have some, you know, kind of normal flavors in here, fruit punch, vanilla ice cream, even popcorn. But then they have a hot dog flavored candy corn and a hamburger flavored candy corn. So it's, um, you know, anticipation of football season coming up. So I don't know, candy corn is already so polarizing. So hot dog flavored candy corn, I can only imagine. I sort of feel like this particular package design and the way they have the five things lined up, it reminds me more of teeth than corn. <laughs> that one has a cavity. <laughs> but I'd be interested in the comments to hear if people would try it. 
Um, and then uh, this is the one everybody surely heard about, which is the Chaco Taco being discontinued by Klondike. So Klondike said that they actually have uh, a lot of demand for their other products. So they were going to discontinue the Chaco Taco. It actually went off shelves in July. But then you saw this huge uproar, which I feel like happens every time. You know, if we're going to take something away from you. Everybody flips out. Then they say, OK, we're going to bring it back. They haven't said for sure that they're going to bring it back, but they just did announce that, you know, they're looking into bringing it back in the future. There are a bunch of brands that said that they were willing to buy it and bring it back. But I think the really interesting thing was that you saw so many independent operators across the country jumping on this bandwagon and creating their own Chaco Tacos. I don't think there was a city that didn't have some, you know, independent operator that had a cool Chaco Taco on their menu. We had like five or six in Chicago that were just going crazy with it. So um, it was a real opportunity for a lot of operators. I love that. And these are going for hundreds of dollars on eBay now too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's Klondike. You know, I, I think back to like, they're like one of the companies I think of when, the, when you think of like, you know, memorable food jingles, like, oh, yeah. the old, what, like would what would you do, do for yeah. Klondike? <laughs> we don't have so many of those anymore, do we? Like, I it's feel true, like we yeah, had a bunch of those in the that, 80s yeah. and 90s, but do we still have like new memorable food jingles? Ooh, good question. Yeah. Like, does anything come to mind? I mean, McDonald's still has, you know, do, 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 do. That's true. Um, yeah, that's pretty catchy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know who's making new ones though. Like you don't see a lot of the upstart brands doing that. Yeah, I feel like like yeah. that jingle thing was a big deal like back in the 80s and 90s, and we sort of moved away from yeah. it in favor of other stuff. But okay. I uh, used to have a CD growing up of food jingles. Maybe that would like is partly <laughs> why I got into this industry. I remember the Chiquita Banana song was on there. Um, and then uh, a TikTok trend, got to, you know, talk about some of the TikTok trends. So this is, it couldn't be simpler. It's spicy rosé, and it's literally just putting slices of jalapeno in your rosé. So, uh, and it's huge. It's all over TikTok, something like 500 million views on TikTok. Um, you know, absolutely simple option. I think, you know, we see a lot of spicy beverages anymore. I don't know if anybody does. Um, Trader Joe's has the jalapeno margaritas. Or the, it's actually jalapeno lime juice, and then you can make a margarita with it. Um, so I think this makes sense. I think it's you know only a matter of time before we see a restaurant do something uh, like spicy so, rosé. I think the answer is yes, based on some of the stuff you've shown, Mike. But are are companies ever good at launching their own sort of TikTok food trends, or is it always sort of organic coming from just end users that make up their own thing? Yeah, I think the organic ones are the ones that really resonate with people. And then this is an interesting one. I always just think it's interesting to see what major chains are doing in other countries. So this is in South Korea. McDonald's was doing kind of a flavors of South Korea menu, which was celebrating the foods and ingredients that are either found in South Korea or grown there. And so they did this. I'm going to mispronounce it, but the Bosong green tea pork burger. So it's a variety of um, pig that is actually fed fermented green tea. And so it said that the, um, the pork product itself actually is less greasy. Um, it said the animal itself actually has less of an odor to it. So it's kind of, you know, a premium pork product. So they're using it um, in this Bosong green tea pork burger that was just released, um, which I think is interesting. And I was thinking about it, you know, you see other countries kind of, you know, they have these different types of proteins that are fed a particular, you know, in Spain, you know, you have the pigs that are fed the acorns. In, you know, Japan, you have the, you know, cows that are fed, um, you know, beer. We don't really have anything like that in the states i feel like you know we should do like an all-american like apple fed you know type of protein or something like that. oh it sounds delicious yeah you know yeah apple like apple fed pork sounds amazing yeah, yeah. sounds good so is this supposed to taste different because of what they're fed? They're I don't to... think you taste green tea but yeah they do say the pork is particularly delicious it's not, not as greasy that's amazing that there's enough to supply mcdonald's to do McDonald's, that mcdonald's right that's yeah pretty amazing what is this? And then this one was in the news a lot, particularly if you are a pet lover. So this <laughs> is Purina's Fancy Feast. And they're going, I know Jared, he's got cats and he loves cats. Um, so they are opening a, a pop-up restaurant in New York called Gatto Bianco, so the white cat. And it's an Italian themed restaurant. And um, it 
And part of, they're actually releasing a new product called Medley, so they wanted to get some attention for it. So this is a human restaurant, so, you know, humans actually eat there, but they had their corporate chef, so the, you know, chef who actually creates food products for cats, um, and they worked with a human chef, so, you know, a chef who creates products for humans, and they worked together to create this menu that's supposed to be inspired by the flavors and textures that you might feed a cat, but it is particularly for humans. Well, so, it's, so actually, it's, the food's yeah. Is human food inspired by cat food? Inspired by cat food. Exactly. What does that mean? It's yeah. all tuna? I mean, what is what is I that? don't know. So it's funny when you look at like the actual dishes they're serving, they just look like really good dishes. There's like a asobuco style salmon and there's a lemon panna cotta. So I don't actually know yeah, like where kind of the cat inspiration comes from. Um, but they said it is inspired by the flavor. I mean, I guess you feed, you know, salmon to the cats a lot. Um, but it's not like mush on a plate. It's not like, you know, the canned cat food that you see. Or they can give you a, a human nip or something. <laughs> yeah. But, I but feel it's like definitely it's... something that's just designed to get attention. It's literally only 16 people had the chance to eat here. So it's a oh. very limited number of people who can get the table. There's some trolling going on too, because there's a reflection of a dog in that window as well. Is there? Oh, yeah. oh you're yeah. right. Good catch. Jeez, yeah. Well, that that was the one that's not point. real, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's our, our Frank one. This is, um, so now, you know, with that last one, we're kind of getting into some cool concepts around the country, just, um, you know, interesting openings. So this is Plant Pub. It's a brewery that just opened outside of Fenway in Boston. And it's a completely vegan brewery that just opened outside of the ballpark. And uh, I think it's just a, a great concept. You know, they're taking vegan foods and, you know, plant-based foods, but it's all those, you know, um, really kind of outlandish or really comfort food driven um, types of products that consumers not just want, you know, outside of a ballpark, but in general, you know, why we saw so many of those plant-based burgers. So they're doing, um, you know, plant-based hot dogs, which is both the meat analogs and they're doing the carrot hot dogs. They have have, um, I know, I think there's nachos on the menu. There's a fried chicken sandwich on the menu. Um, so it's just, I, I think it's a really interesting concept out of Boston. Um, everything looks so craveable and yet, you know, you don't necessarily have any of that guilt. To eat it. It's interesting because pub food really lends itself well to plant-based, right? Mm -hmm. Burgers, sausages, you know, fried chicken. These, these are all things where plant-based product exists already. Mm -hmm. Are they doing mm -hmm. any like the next gen stuff like banana blossoms and, and that type of thing or more? It didn't look like, yeah, I think they're, you know, trying, it's a huge restaurant. So I think they're trying to get as many consumers as possible, but we'll see. And this is, they're going for the sport fan. Yeah, I know. I look, not when you traditionally what you would expect. The plant yeah, like when you think the Red Sox fan, you don't necessarily think, you know, vegan, you know, so I think it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Go for it. Yeah. And then this is an interesting concept. Yes. So it's a growing concept. It's outside of, there are a lot of cats in the in the webinar today. But this is a brand outside of uh, Toledo, Ohio, that's looking to expand across the country. They just opened this new location in Detroit. They have another one um, opening in Jackson. In Bill, Florida, pretty soon. Uh, but it's, um, you can kind of see on the left hand side of their sign there, their motto is to keep pizza weird. So they actually have so many different toppings, sauces, crusts that you can make. Um, it's about 2 million different combinations of pizza. And it's, you know, normal stuff, marinara sauce, but it's also really outlandish stuff. So the pizza crust, I think there's six or seven different pizza crust options. And there's a hemp uh, pizza crust option, there's a chicken pizza crust option, which is, you know, Know, literally just a flat piece of chicken that you can build your pizza on top of. I think there's like 26 different sauces, including some sauces. There's like a dewberry sauce that I don't even know what that is. So just a really interesting concept. Um, and the cool thing too is, uh, so they also do, you know, for the morning day part to capture, um, you know, consumer traffic, they do steamed bagels, um, steamed breakfast sandwich bagels in the morning. So interesting concept. So I, it's hard to tell from the picture. It almost looks like it's like a pickle pizza that's on that front door. They something. do. They have pickles. They have, pickles are one of the toppings. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know about that pickle pizza idea. It's becoming part. We we did the pizza fest here in Chicago two weeks ago, and one of the operators was doing a pickle pizza. It's almost like this is like a, a twelve year old TikTok account made a restaurant. <laughs> we this. Just but yeah, throw everything on. But it's making, I mean, I've read tons of stories about this. It's making a big splash, right? And mm -hmm. it's, yeah. how many stories you said now? The, um, it'll be three when they open the Jacksonville store. So still pretty small, but lots of attention. And you think it's all like, like Gen Zers that come here? Um, I don't know. I think it's a, 
so a wide variety. I mean, everybody likes to customize their pizza, and this is kind of the ultimate in customization. Like, don't you think this scares away certain, like? Oh sure, like I don't think. Either, so like, what is that? And just yeah, I think uh, they're they're choosing their markets carefully. Definitely. I feel like you have to wear pajamas into this place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then uh, this is the concept out of Australia. And so this is Karen's Diner. And um, if you've ever been to like Edna Bevix here in Chicago or a Dick's restaurant, I think there's a, a restaurant in Disney World that does something like it where, you know, the, the servers yell at you and make fun of you. Yeah. This is a pop-up concept. So they did it in Australia and it's based on American diners. They specifically say, I think they even explain like what an American Karen and, you know, the whole concept of the Karen is to the Australian consumer. It did really Really well i think they did something like five or six markets in australia so then they opened one in um, the uk now the uk one is doing really well and so they're actually going to bring it to the states now so um, i know it's going to come to chicago um, in the winter so just kind of an interesting pop-up concept can i ask a question so is if anyone uh watching today is named karen or is close to someone who's named karen can you just put in chat like or comment like how this whole thing is like affected you impacted you I'm, yeah. I'm just like personally like really curious about that i feel like it's like super unfair to all the people that that have that name already but i i agree i like i have some karens in my life that are absolutely fantastic people i think <laughs> yes. we should have like made up a name um this is a cool concept so i i said i went camping this weekend um so this is the general store so it's a partnership between getaway and walmart so getaway is a company that kind of has these um small cabins um it, outside of big cities across the country so they're you know two hours away from a big city if you want to get away and they're doing really great i think by the end of the year they plan to have something like 28 different getaway locations across the u.s and so walmart's their first retail partner where they're putting some of these general stores in getaway outposts where getaway curates from walmart selection um, you know a selection of cool brands and foods and things that you might use camping so um, i don't think we have a picture of the interior but the interior looks really nice that looks awesome. That looks so cool. Yeah. Great example of a partnership. And then I think the last one here is, um, this is uh, our only tech one, which I feel like we usually have a lot of tech, but this is a Birmingham, Alabama based company. It was five um, foodies in Alabama who noticed the employee shortage at the restaurants um, you know, in their city there. And so they created this app and it's basically kind of a gig economy um, you know, style app, but for the restaurant industry. So if you're a restaurant or you're a bar, um, you know, you can put a posting on the app that we need a bartender tonight or we need a server tonight. And then, you know, gig economy, um, you know, employees can go on here um, and, you know, find a job that night or in the upcoming weekend. It doesn't cost anything for the employee. It costs a little bit um, for the restaurant or the bar to do. And um, uh, Birmingham actually just hosted the World Games. And so they had a huge influx of people coming into the city. And they said this app, you know, really kind of saved a lot of the restaurants because it allowed them to find temporary help with all of the people coming into the city. What an awesome idea. I don't think yeah, you can get people that actually cook food though, right? You can probably do so, uh, you, you can actually kind of, you can see on the right hand side there, there's, uh, you know, that listing is we need somebody who's serve safe certification yep. certified. So you can actually have requirements for the people you hire. Wow, pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, a couple other quick things that we're gonna use as a pivot. So I don't know if many of you have seen this, it's made the news recently. There's a, a business called Wonder, which is food delivery, but it actually cooks the food uh, basically on its way to you. So you get the thing, you know, super fresh and hot, which supposedly takes care of one of the biggest frustrations people have with delivered food, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And it's like really high end restaurants that does this for as well. Not like the normal, you know, $20, $15 type of places, but you know, some things that are bordering on fine dining too. So we'll see if this works. I think the the need is certainly there. Whether the business model will support this, uh, I guess uh, time will tell. And with that, we're going to pivot into a, a little microscopic look at some information from our new Food at Home keynote report, which you'll also find in Report Pro. And Jared is here to take us through some of those details. Now, I do want to set things up a little bit. So we do some tracking through, um, with our partners at IFMA on just how people eat. And uh, a couple of the numbers to know right now is that 73% of all eating decisions are initiated inside the home. So when you first get that impulse that says, hey, I want to get something to eat, 73% of the time that's happening while you or someone else 
is inside the home. It's not when you're on the road. It's not when you're sitting, you know, at work or, you know, someplace else. That first impulse comes at home. And if you look at the percentage of food service occasions, right? So these are, th these are occasions where food was actually bought from a restaurant or some other away from home place. Um, we're eating a lot of that food at home anyways. Now, the pandemic totally changed things. In 2019, one third of food sourced from food service was eaten at home. By 2021, because of COVID, that number jumped to 51%. I mean, a monumental increase. And it's receded a little bit now that restaurants and stuff are fully back open again. But if we think that we're sitting in the new normal as it stands right now, we're still 11 percentage points higher today at 44% than where we were in 2019. And I think we're basically in sort of that new normal already, right? I don't think we're going to go back to that 33 numbers. I think COVID and the work from home thing has created a systemic change as to where we're eating uh, food that we get from restaurants and other places. It's not always in the restaurant itself. It's sometimes it's in the car, sometimes it's on the road, but more often than you know any other type of place, we're eating that restaurant and away from home food inside the home itself. Okay. So uh, Jared, there's an interesting dichotomy I think you wanted to share with us, right? Definitely. And I think that this dichotomy was by far the most fascinating thing to me in this keynote. And you know, what I noticed is that off-premise dining really sits at the nexus of two different worlds, uh, digital ordering and traditional ordering. And, you know, one thing you have to think about is that half our society grew up in a world where if you want to learn a fact, you had to wait till the library open, dr drive there, look it up in a book. Uh, you balanced your checkbook with, you know, on the back of it with a paper and pen. And now, you know, our younger generations, everything's instant. Uh, you can communicate with anyone in the world instantly. You can look up a fact instantly. You can get TikTok videos, just, you know, streaming, you know, before the next one's even finished. Um, and that impact of that really affects this industry or this segment, um, off-premise dining. And, you know, one of the most uh, vivid ways that uh, is demonstrated is now that uh, the mobile apps are now the most preferred ordering methods for off-premise dining. And, you know, it's crazy to see that it's, it's unseated in-person ordering. And what's interesting, um, and I kind of just alluded to this, is that this is really divided along generational lines. We can see Gen Z and millennial consumers by far prefer to use mobile apps to ordering um, off-premise. But on the other end, Spectrum, Boomers, you know, definitely prefer to talk to people still. So yeah, and we should clarify, this is how do you prefer to order for um, times that you're eating off-premise, whether you're taking right. it to go or having it delivered or something else. But I think what's interesting is that um, mobile beats every other uh, every other way for every generation other than boomers, right, which still tend to prefer phone a little bit. But even that phone number, that 56% of boomers prefer phone versus 30% that prefer mobile, that's the number today in 2022. I think the data is just probably a few weeks old. Um, we actually have a, sort of like an analogous view from 2017 when we first started exploring this. So we're, the, the gap right now is 56 versus 30 for boomers in favor of phone. If you go back to 2017, it was 64 versus seven. The gap was so much bigger. So even among boomers, that mobile app preference number has dr dramatically increased and the gap has narrowed substantially over just the last five years. So the question is, Will mobile ever surpass phone for boomers? Uh, you know, it's sort of like a it's it, there's a race going on over here, and we'll see uh, which force wins that race, I guess. Uh, but tell us about how people like to order um, via an app. This one was extremely interesting to me too. So we asked, um, when you use a mobile app, do you prefer to use a restaurant's proprietary app or a third party service like Uber Eats, Grubhub, uh, Postmates, and we see overwhelmingly consumers prefer to use uh, individual restaurant apps. Um, and, you know, this was surprising, uh, especially because like, you know, you think about using food service apps, like at least for me, I think of those third party delivery ones. But then, um, you know, looking just even at the keynote, last off premise occasions, less than a quarter of those were delivery. So a lot of what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, pickup, takeout, curbside pickup. Um, it's ordering ahead, right, for pickup. That's that's driving quite a bit of this. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, but it's, it's, and I think that was certainly accelerated by COVID 
as well, right? You can't go into the, the restaurant anymore. You had to sort of order ahead. And that's when we saw a huge, huge spike in order ahead activity, which drives even more of this technology reliance. Um, and I think you found some interesting stuff about drones that you had substantial numbers of consumers that are actually excited for this drone delivery thing, which seems so weird not long ago. I know, and this is like my favorite thing to talk about. Um, I know the word drone definitely doesn't like bring the warmest image to people's minds, uh, especially after like you know, all the wars and whatnot. But we do see that um, more than a fifth of consumers and a fifth of operators alike are enthused by the idea. Um, and, you know, of course, a lot of other people, you know, most people kind of are apprehensive of this technology still, but I think that with higher gas prices, labor strains, um, even more of a habitual shift to off-premise dining, I could see a scenario where it's more expensive not to use drones one day, you know, 20 years from now, are we still going to be loading things in our cars and taking them places? It seems like, I don't know, maybe inevitable. Yeah. And, you know, look, this has been a thing that's been talked about for quite some time. I mean, we've featured it uh, certainly in the past as well. And uh, now you're seeing a lot of media coming up that's saying, you know what, hey, we're all these drones that you promised us. You know, Amazon said we'd have delivery drones and it's taking a lot longer than um, we thought it would. Sort of like the same thing with um, driverless cars, right? They're not quite on the streets as fast as maybe some had predicted. So what's going on with them? Well, maybe the technology is really hard, the economics of mass delivery might never make sense. But then you have um, companies like this, Flytrex, which says, hey, Mike, you're nodding your head. Are you, are you familiar with this one? Yeah, they're, I mean, I think we've covered them on the webinar in the past, but they're kind of the one all over TikTok. If you see a consumer showcasing, hey, I got my rotisserie chicken delivered by drone from Walmart, it's, you know, Flytrex. Yeah, it's, it's, it's there now. I think they're delivering in Texas, and I think they're trying to expand their markets. Uh, I think early this year, they got some sort of additional FAA clearance to fly drones over your head. Uh, and the idea is simple. We'll get you your food in five minutes um, or so. And here's um, here's what that actual drone looks like. Like this actually scares me uh, a little bit. So I, I had, you know, one of those little like DJI drones. And I remember once my finger hit the prop and like it almost sliced my finger off. Like this thing looks like it, it could decapitate you if it goes the wrong way, but I guess it's safe enough to deliver your coffee uh, or ice cream. I think they deliver ice cream and, and all sorts of things that you think would be impossible to deliver because they would melt or, you know, temperature or whatnot. But in five minutes, it can get there. And here's what it looks like in practice. So, uh, yeah, there are some of these out there in the wild now for sure. So I don't know if any of you are in a market where this exists. I've never seen one personally with my own eyes, but if you have experience, Definitely share it with uh, everyone here on the on, on on the webinar. I'd be curious to see what your experiences have been. It's interesting too. You see some of the ones that hover and like slowly lower the food to the ground, which is probably what you need to deliver like a beverage. But then some of them, it just sends them out by parachute and it slams into the ground. I mean, like the rotisserie chicken one I was talking about. I was like, there's no way that rotisserie chicken is still intact. So is this? This, I mean, this picture makes it look like it's a parachute thing, right? Is yeah, that one looks like a parachute, yeah. So, what happens? The whole box drops to the ground. No, then... no, it's um, so I, for the ones I've seen, like you know, something would open up at the bottom there, and it's just um, you know, a cardboard box that drops down from a parachute, huh? Yeah, and the parachute and they are, it's wrapped up, it has a lot of um, you know, packaging around it to make sure it's intact. I mean, just think about like the having to deal with like wind and and all these other factors. I mean, th so they're trying to deliver. Will they deliver to someone's house or only to like a big public area where there's a ton of land or something? No, nope, they'll deliver to people's houses. Yeah. How do you do that with wind? Like, how how is it not going to blow away and like your your neighbor is going to get your sandwich? Uh, I, don't I don't get know, that good question. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Well. We know too, Jared, there are some frustrations that consumers face when they're either ordering via phone or via app. What are some of the phone frustrations and, and what jumped out at you here? Definitely. And these, and it's interesting, the phone frustrations are, you know, considerably different than the app frustrations. But what jumped out to me here was that a lot of the more prominent uh, frustrations deal with poor customer service. You know, the people are hard to understand. They feel rushed. Um, you know, they're not really like talking about what's available. They just want to get the order done. And, you know, I think from an operator perspective, for a, a potential patron, that's th their first exposure to your brand. So you want to definitely make sure that, you know, anyone taking the phone orders are amazing. Otherwise, it definitely like impacts the experience quite a bit. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly a thing. I'll tell you a funny story. So we had our uh, data central uh, board meeting at our office in Chicago on a couple of months ago or, or something. And uh, we thought it'd be fun to just order like some authentic Chinese food that might be scary to non-Chinese people um, for that. So I called up like one of the local restaurants and ordered like, you know, like frogs. And like, I think there was some uh, like sea cucumber thing and some other like, I think it's something that had like an eyeball in it, like just some pretty scary stuff. Then I get a call and I ordered it through like a third party app. And then I get a call back from the restaurant from a woman who uh, I look like I should speak Chinese, but I don't. So I didn't really understand exactly what she, what she was saying. And I tried to explain to her, okay, you don't have that item. Please replace it with the most bizarre item. I didn't know. I was trying to find a delicate way of saying this that, that, that you can, because that's sort of the whole point. And she would say, oh, so you want General Tso's chicken? I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the exact opposite of what I want. And I think in the end, we got something that was moderately bizarre, but not as completely bizarre as we would like. So yes, uh, having difficulty communicating with the person on the other end is certainly a challenge sometime. Uh, how about for apps? It's it's considerably different, you know, um, especially, you know, as we saw like the general breakdown, uh, people that aren't tech savvy, it can be a difficult thing the first few times. And Frustrations with these really come down to a lack of customer support. You know, you can't ask questions. Um, if you make a mistake, it's like, can you change it? You know, do you have to call the restaurant? Might as well just call them in the first place. Um, so, and and actually another one here that you know I totally agree with is having to set up a username and password to just get food from somewhere. That, you know, that can be annoying. Just having a million usernames. Um, but I think like, you know, and I, I mentioned this in the keynote quite a bit, but. Having pictures is important. Having uh, open-ended text boxes, just to even just to give the illusion of control uh, to the person placing the order, I think is good. Yeah, this is very true, and we've actually asked um, this same set of questions for a number of years now. I think when we first started really looking at delivery, it was in the mid 2010s. But I remember from our uh, work from about five years ago, you saw maybe the numbers have changed a little bit, but similar types of rankings. So some of the issues that were issues back then still continue to be issues now, right? Not being able to ask questions, not being able to see like a picture of what the thing looks like. And there was always this fear of that box where you could type in like special instructions that you'll type something in there and it just goes into hyperspace and they get it going like, hey, I'm allergic to peanuts. And like, are they gonna see that or, or not? Um, you don't, it's that you don't get feedback coming out the other side. It's sort of like a one-way communication type of thing. And sort of with that in mind, um, I'm gonna sort of, take us back to some things that we've looked at. I'm gonna, you know, what we just saw Jared pre uh, present is data from like the last few weeks, basically. I would actually have us go back a couple of years right now. I think like two years, I, I think this is about 2020 data and show you some of the things that we learned about the uh, perceptions of delivery um, a couple of years ago. And I think much of this still holds true today. One thing we asked uh, consumers is, hey, if you had to compare dine-in and delivery in each one of these areas that you see here on screen, which do you think offers a better experience in those areas? And across the board, it's dine-in. Like you don't, you hardly get um, many votes for delivery in any one of these areas. And you certainly don't get a, uh, a majority of votes in any of these areas. Uh, there is one area of course where delivery wins hands down. It's the only one is convenience of course, but you get seen all these other things that are sort of important to the experience, right? I mean, when you eat or you get food from a restaurant someplace, it's not just the food, it's like the entire thing. Um, you know, dine-in really, really holds a huge advantage and delivery still has a lot to catch up with. So, you know, I'm gonna repeat some things that we've said in the past, because I think it still is instructive today. If you're a restaurant or if you're working with your restaurant partners, there's some basic things that they can do that I think really helps improve the experience. Maybe not by making um, the food necessarily better, which is you know a challenge to get it delivered that way, but at least makes you know at least we don't drop the ball on uh, you know really easy mistakes we shouldn't be making as part of that experience. One like on the receipt or someplace else, like check off every single item on that order. Let the consumers know that. Um, you saw that it's supposed to include the fries and the chicken sandwich and that nothing was missed. Just a little like highlighter tick mark. You know, it takes like two, it's like when you exit Costco and that person at the door sort of is like, oh, you got this, this, and this. They you just do that, but in a much smaller scale. And I think it's going to put consumers really at ease. Two, and we're really happy that 
Um, you know, many restaurants do this now. Um, when you put a sticker or some other seal on the bag, a lot of people thought this was going to be a COVID only thing. I think this is a really good idea long term. You hear all these weird stories about how delivery drivers sometimes will eat a French fry uh, or something. So hopefully this protects against that too. It costs almost nothing and it's a branding opportunity as well. Three, the packaging, right? This is a sushi place near me in Miami. Look how glorious this packaging is. Here's their omakase box. And they the box is educational. It tells you the order in which to eat your sushi, what all the different pieces are, you know, what it actually is, the types of sauces you should have with it. The whole thing feels like an experience and goes so far beyond the typical packaging you might see with delivery food. Uh, and this is personal picture I took um, on a trip to Seattle a couple years ago where uh, I ordered like one of these omakase sushi boxes from a place over there and I wrote in the note, you know, that notes feel that I'm so scared of that no one's gonna actually read. I said, hey, could you include some ponzu sauce? So not only did they read, so that one, they didn't have ponzu sauce, but they actually read the note and they wrote me a handwritten note saying, sorry, we don't have it, but please enjoy your dinner. This actually made me happier than if they actually gave me the damn ponzu sauce in the first place. You know, these things aren't that expensive to do and they can take maybe, you know, an, a mediocre experience and turn them into a much, much better one, even if you can't deliver on the thing the customer was originally asking for. So I think these are just some little things that every restaurant should consider doing if we really want to take delivery seriously. But I know, Jared, we uh, we looked at some feedback from operators as well. And, and what do they tell us? That's right. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see some of the drawbacks uh, to using uh, third party services or partnering with them rather on the next slide. But there are there is a silver lining, too. And, um, you know, especially since the onset of the pandemic, restaurants with more of a shift to off premise have been able to reach new customers. And, you know, you got to think um, you partner with one of these services that all your attributes of your restaurants aggregated on a list. And, you know, if someone you're an Italian restaurant, someone has a craving for Italian, they may never have even known about your restaurant or even thought of ordering there, but now they can do it instantly. And, you know, it's like that marketing axiom about, you know, retaining customers as opposed to getting new ones. Um, a lot of restaurants got new ones um, yep. over the last few years shifting to off-premise. For sure. Uh, but there are some perceived drawbacks as well. Definitely. And, you know, it's kind of like a contentious thing um, in, some, in some ways, but, um, most operators actually, you know, four out of five say that, you know, their, their bottom lines being impacted um, on these third party sales and, um, you know, definitely a big issue for them. But I think, you know, even more interesting to that than that is just the issue of just the loss of control with the, like the final result with the um, person receiving the food, you have no control over that, you know, um, the drive, you know, you have no control over the friendliness of the driver dropping off the food and all of those different things. And they're representing your brand in that capacity. Um, and I think like, you know, from the consumer perspective, in some instances, there's not a lot of maybe understanding that the drivers have absolutely nothing to do um, with how the food was prepared, you know, in that sense too. So it's kind of like a, it works both ways in that sense. Yeah, I mean, we we've heard for a while now that um, the the fees sometimes are uh, you know putting so much pressure on operators that some of them just can't do it anymore. Maybe they did it out of necessity during COVID, but coming out of COVID, uh, they they would reevaluate whether that still made financial sense for them to do. It really depends on the particular situation. But look at some of the other things that are on here too. So less control over the customer relationship, right? So these are things. Yes, that's true. But these are things that as a restaurant, you could still address in some other ways with how you do your packaging, do you wrap up your utensils really nicely, do you include like a note, right? You could probably still mitigate that in some ways, less control over the final food quality. I think we need some more innovation in, in this regard to, to really address that, but I think that's probably um, addressable in the intermediate term. Um, and then if you look at, you know, less control over patrons interaction with delivery drivers, yeah, that one's a little bit tough, right? You know, who, who knows? exactly what's going to happen but you know, a lot of these are at least addressable if not solvable that said um we're going to preview one little piece of data among uh hundreds of pieces of data from our one table work that we're going to really deep dive into on our next webinar but one of the things we asked operators there is what are some of the things that you've done in reaction to the current landscape of labor shortages supply chain disruptions and high inflation 
And you can see that 27% of their, they've transitioned more towards more off-premise as a result of this. You know, they're probably looking for other revenue streams. But nearly as many have said they've actually just eliminated third-party delivery altogether. And it's exactly as Jared said, that, you know, coming into COVID, the concern was about the top line. How do we get, you know, people back to the door, people in our seats? How do we make sure we have revenue? And now it's become a story of bottom line and managing your profit margins. And sometimes those delivery fees can be large enough that it so puts so much pressure on your margins, especially when your food costs are up as much as they are, that many operators are just dropping third-party deliveries and opting for less revenue in favor of better margins at the end of the day. So with that, I want to show you something that I thought was really interesting. We said, well, what could we look at in some of our other tools that'll tell us a little bit of a story of you know what we could be doing a better job with as it relates to um, delivered food as an industry? So we have a, a platform that many of you use that's called Scores. It basically looks at every single new item that a chain restaurant um, launches, whether it's an LTO or a brand new item or a returning item. We have all of them, and then we test each one of those with consumers as they launch. To get consumer feedback on, you know, do you like this or not? Would you buy it? Is it unique to you? And you can sort of see, here's an example. This is a crab and lobster fries. That sounds, actually sounds pretty good. Um, from Glory Days Grill, you can see some of the metrics that we have. But if you go a little bit further down the page, you can see that we have a new question that we added when COVID began. So we have, I think, almost 40,000 items that we've uh, published in scores. I think we have 10,000 items nearly where we have this dining preference question where we say, hey, for this particular dish, um, you know, what's the appeal of having this delivered to you, uh, something you might take to go or at the drive through versus eating it inside the restaurant? As you would imagine, something like crab and lobster fries, probably because it has, you know, seafood on it and they're French fries, people are much more likely to say this is appealing to have in a restaurant, but maybe don't feel as great about it being delivered, right? Sort of makes sense. On the flip side, you have something like the everything stuffed bagel minis at Dunkin', where people are like, yeah, this is definitely uh, something I take to go through the drive through Probably not as crazy about eating it inside of a restaurant. That doesn't seem like as appropriate of a place to have this. And I'm not really thinking of this as a delivery food so much. So we said, well, what happens if we look at all the items that chains have released over the past couple of years? So I think like nine or 10,000 items in total. And we said, let's look at the average appeal for delivery versus dine-in versus um, to-go by segment. So here's the dine-in number. So this shows you that on average, the items that casual dining restaurants and mid-scale dining restaurants and fine dining restaurants have released, like the thousands of items that they've released over the past couple of years, those items are thought to be on average more appealing for dine-in than the stuff that you would see that was launched by a C-store or a QSR, which makes total sense right? Versus, let's say, this green line, which is the appeal for drive through and to-go. And it would make sense. Things that are launched at a C-store or a QSR or a fast casual are thought to be more appealing to take to-go or to drive through than the types of things you'd see on as new menu launches at mid-scale casual and fine dining. Makes sense, right? But look at the delivery line. This is what's interesting. This blue line is that same number, but appeal for delivery. So there's a couple of things to observe. One, it's lower across the board. The, the menu items that uh, we're releasing as an industry just aren't as appealing for delivery as they are for dine-in or drive through or to-go. So that's number one. Number two, the line's flat. It's like basically a flat line. It doesn't have something that goes up and to the right or down and to the right. There is no discernible, discernible trend. There's nothing that shows that, let's say, that, you know, uh, limited service restaurants or full service restaurants are releasing more delivery friendly items than, uh, than others. It's basically just flat, which means maybe we haven't really found a way to sort of optimize and solve for um, delivery appealing food just yet. But what gets even crazier is if we don't look at this just by segment, what if we cut this by the type of item instead? So here's that same chart. We took the numbers out so you, so you could see a little bit more of the line. Instead of having segments going across the bottom over here, we have um, different types of uh, foods. And the thing that you notice immediately is, again, regardless of the type of food, that blue line is below the pink dining line and the green drive-through line. The blue delivery line is lower in every single case. 
And the thing that was most shocking to us is that this number for pizza over here is really not like we would have thought that the pizza number would have been much, much higher because we're so accustomed to thinking about pizza as a delivery food. But as of today, even pizza fails to spike considerably, you know, up, up on this chart. Now, the really fascinating part of that is this did not always, this wasn't always the case. Previously, in let's say 2020, before everyone got super accustomed with third party delivery, you actually saw a really big spike in pizza where it approached or even exceeded the appeal, where its delivery appeal even, even exceeded or approached uh, its appeal for dine in a drive through. Like that blue line, you know, pierced all the way up to the top over here in 2020. Over time, though, that blue line has gotten lower and lower. And I think what we've essentially experienced is a phenomenon where people have gotten so accustomed to the notion that all food is deliverable, that the notion that pizza is a delivery food has sort of washed away a little bit. So the success of delivery overall has made pizza feel less like a special delivery food. And you see this very clearly in the numbers. This is the average delivery appeal for pizza in 2020 versus 2021 versus 2022. In just two years, this is across hundreds of different pizzas that have launched on menus during that time. Um, you've had a seven percentage point drop in delivery appeal for pizza. That's a big, big change. And that seven percentage points accounts for delivery, you know, either being as good, you know, as appealing as dine-in or to go, or it being much lower than the appeal for dine-in to go that we see today. So uh, we think there's a lot that we could still do as an industry to make delivery foods more appealing. Uh, you know, by necessity, everything became deliverable um, since the outset of COVID. But there's a lot of innovation work that can be done right now to really amp up the delivery thing, because it's certainly not going away. It's, you know, the, the convenience factor is hard to ignore. We saw that 73% of food decisions are initiated in the home. 44% um, of food sourced away from home is actually eaten inside the home, and delivery is a big, big piece of it. We should be doing more stuff that is optimized for that environment. So uh, when it comes to taking food on the road or brought back to the home, we think there's certainly an opportunity to continue to innovate. Um, okay, so in two weeks, we're doing a big, big webinar. Seriously, invite all your colleagues, if they care about what's happening with labor, supply chain, inflation, and what this means for operators and what suppliers should be doing about it, you really do not want to miss this. This is our deep dive into the one table research. It's gonna be on this same webinar in two weeks, August 18th at 12 p.m. Central. It's gonna be um, really, really important for you to attend and get your colleagues to attend. So please invite them. Uh, they can sign up on the Data Central website.